Today is Tuesday, June 30th, 2015, and we are interviewing Robert Shippen at the Santa Cruz Public Library in Santa Cruz, California. My name is Jeannie Zarnicki, and Jennifer Cockrell is recording. We both work for the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Robert, when and where were you born? I was born in Oakland, California on the 29th of September, 1946. Okay. And what was your branch of service in the war you served in? I served in the United States Army and during the Vietnam era and during the Vietnam War. And what was your highest rank? Sergeant E-5. Okay. So let's start off with having you tell us a little bit about your family background, um, where you grew up, and uh, what you were doing before you enlisted. Oh, okay. Well, I was born, like I said, in Oakland, California, in September of 46, about nine months after my dad got back from the Second World War. My mom was at UC Berkeley, and uh, when they, she graduated, um, he took a job with his father in Camp Hill, Alabama for the, the Ship and Lumber Company, where his dad was working, <clears throat> had several lumber companies there. So I grew up in Alabama, and I'm the eldest of, eventually there were eight of us children, and uh, most of us were born in Alabama, but I think two or three were actually born in Georgia. We moved to rural Georgia along the Altamaha River Valley watershed, basically. The Okmulgee and the Oconee Rivers come together to the, from the Altamaha River. So it was the Deep South um, is where I grew up, and I eventually uh, graduated from high school in Savannah, Georgia, and I went to college in Savannah, Georgia. And after my first semester of college, I dropped out because it was just almost impossible to go to school without some help and I needed to work and help the family and I just needed a job big time. So as soon as I dropped out I got a draft notice <laughs> and um, I had kind of felt like uh, I owed my country a couple of years of service anyway having grown up after the Second World War and with all of my aunts and uncles and uh, parents uh, friends, they were all veterans of the war, and some of my high school classmates had been, whose parents had survived the Holocaust, they had, you know, in, in uh, Germany and Eastern Europe. So I kind of felt really like I owed my country at least a couple of years of my life. So when I got my draft notice, I decided to beat the draft by joining. So I enlisted in the United States Army uh, in in uh, January of 1966 and um, basically what had happened was uh, I wanted to uh, sort of go out there and do the dance basically and to get into the action whatever it was and wherever it was and Vietnam was just a rumor I hadn't really heard about it I was still my me my mindset was actually still part of the Cold War during uh, like the Korean conflict and um, after the Second World War and um, <clears throat> we had had quite a few bomb scares in Savannah Georgia at the time you know uh, because of the Cuban Missile Crisis mm -hmm. and I was active in the civil defense and you know took ROTC in college I mean in, in um, high school and uh, I just kind of wanted to go do it whatever it was that my country served uh, had for me so I saw a poster that had a green beret that was a new fangle kind of thing but you couldn't really join to be a green beret you had to volunteer um, for airborne unassigned which means they're going to make you a paratrooper and probably um, put you through infantry training before you're allowed to then volunteer for special forces if you pass the test at any time along the way and you fail they do with you what they will so I joined airborne unassigned and they shipped me off to Fort Jackson South Carolina on January the 3rd of 1966 and uh, 
It was miserable. It was absolutely <laughs> miserable because it was raining and it was in the middle of winter time and there were so many inductees going. They didn't have barracks for us. They put us in old leaky World War II GP tents and the mattresses were soaking wet and they had coal stoves inside them that nobody knew how to work anyway. And they gave us all shots. So everybody was sick reacting to all of the immunizations that we had and people started dying of um, spinal meningitis actually. There were like three or four guys died in my company area, uh, one of them in my tent, actually. Uh, so it was sort of desperation at that time to survive, just the cold. Uh, so I volunteered for KP, so that saved my life, basically. I was a pots and pans man in a hot, <laughs> cold, hot kitchen, you know, while everybody else was freezing. And um, then I went to basic training at Fort Gordon, Georgia. And that was very interesting. I liked it. Uh, it was like there was more food than I could eat. It was like there was m meat every day, every meal if you wanted it. Eggs, real milk, um, bacon, ham, things that I was not really used to because we'd been kind of frugal with eight kids and uh, it, was, it was hard to make it sometimes uh, in Georgia. So I was like I was flourishing, you know, gain weight, and uh, the physical exercise was no big deal. It was fun, you know. I, uh, it was actually exciting. They, they didn't really push any limits yet. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, I think I made private, meaning, you know, I'm private E2. <laughs> and uh, basically, uh, they put me, I went through infantry training, became a light weapons uh, specialist at Fort Gordon, Georgia, AIT. I think that was 16 weeks. Um, I remember one of my instructors, I noticed on your, yeah. your questionnaire, or, you know, about if you remembered anybody that was an instructor. I had an instructor in AIT at Fort Gordon, Georgia, who'd been in the Second World War. He was short, he was fat, he had a big red nose, and he'd been a tanker during the Second World War. And all of us young guys, we were just like, oh, this guy's really been in it. We want to go get close to him and find out. He would be a little half-lit. He was almost always half-lit. He was only an E6, and he'd been in the Army for close to 30 years already, 25 or 30 years, and it's because he was an alcoholic. But it turns out the guy had been a hangman at Leavenworth, and he had also been a hangman during the Nuremberg trials. And I think that contributed to his drinking. So he was an interesting character, and I think they just let him retire. You know, or he probably drank himself to death somewhere down the line. But he was just a nice, gentle soul that kind of herded us young troops around through the through the dy through the dynamics. I made a lot of really close friends with black people. This is the, f the civil rights issue had started happening pretty heavy in the South, and it was pretty brutal in some places with a lot of hatred on both sides. But the army got you know I just we were all. It was a big common denominator and I had, you know, they were good friends of mine and I was a good friend of theirs. And so, after infantry AIT, advanced individual training, I was an expert with an M60 machine gun, an M16 rifle, an M14 rifle, an M1 carbine, uh, 45 caliber, you know, all the light weapons that the military used at the time. I was uh, proficient at their use, and I um, was a basic soldier. And when that period ended, I was about to be shipped off to to uh, jump school to become a paratrooper. And I realized that I was too young to go to special forces. My recruiter had lied to me. I was still too young. You had to be within so many months of your 20th birthday by the time you finished jump school and I was still too young, I was only 19. So I had qualified for OCS, so I, I put in my um, officer's candidate school. So I put in a request for officer's candidate school 
and they put me on a headquarters and headquarters company at the 3rd Training Brigade and I played guerrilla to all the other trainees coming through for light weapons infantry training. I, I would dress up in coveralls and go hide in a swamp and jump up with a blank adapter or pop, you know, do f fake ambushes and run and fall down and let them capture me and stuff like that for a few weeks until I was finally old enough to where when I finished jump school I could then take the Special Forces Qualification Test. So I went to jump school at Fort Benning, Georgia, and it was summer and it was hot. I think it was August. It would have been August of 1966. And um, it was just more of what I had been already been doing all year long, which is running and push-ups and sit-ups and, you know, calisthenics and uh, following orders. And I think I might no, I wasn't even PFC yet. No, not yet. I was close. Um, you know, jump school was scary because I was afraid of heights, you know, and everything. And um, you, uh, you have to actually jump out of this airplane. And, uh, and it was C-119 airplanes, you know, big box car, and the engines would sputter and sputter, and black smoke would pull out. I think the pilots might have been trying to scare us by making it seem like the the engines are failing. And it worked, you know, but we were all terrified anyway. So one terror, one degree of terror is the same as another. And so eventually, when the word go uh, is yelled. That's what we did. We jumped out of the airplane and then started doing it again and again, and that was uh, exhilarating, to say the least, in a terrifying way. But still, it was exhilarating. And so, after jump school, I um, was able to take what's called the SFQT, Special Forces Qualification Test. It's basically to see if you're of average intelligence and if you can take special forces training if you are selected for that. So I passed it and was selected for special forces and uh, was put on a bus with other trainees like myself and shipped to Fort Bragg, North Carolina in the fall of 1966. I think it was September of 1966. So at Fort Bragg, instead of being treated like trainees, you know, being yelled at all the time. We were met by these real green berets and they got off, they, they met us at the bus and treated us like gentlemen and said, "We here's uh, some meal tickets for you and here's a really nice barracks. You know, they had brand new stainless steel brick with, you know, regular mattresses and everything. It wasn't just old World War II leftover barracks, you know, drafty, people dying from spinal meningitis. It was really nice. And the guy says, those of you who are married, you've got your easel, you know, here's a ticket for a motel. You can meet your wives, you know, there and get a custom. We'll meet you here on Monday morning at 7 o'clock. And that was like, well, okay, this is kind of cool. This is a whole new, you know, um, world, basically. And so, um, after the Special Forces, uh, they had a they had a program where they put you through more of the Special Forces type military training. We learned methods of instruction, how to use an interpreter on how to instruct other people. We learned foreign weapons, you know, the German weapons, we had Soviet bloc weapons, we had all kinds of different weapons that different armies in the world were using at that time and we became familiar with them. We learned land navigation and orienteering and map reading and survival techniques basically. They put us through a little thing that's kind of like, you know, mock uh, torture, you know, I guess they, you know, they pour water up our nose with a, a thing on it, you know, like you're drowning, but it was like, you know, it's just another painful experience to endure. It's not that big a deal. And um, this is when, you know, I always wanted to go be like a soldier. I was really cannon fodder. You know, I wanted to go be a soldier, you know, mm -hmm. for my country, mm -hmm. which was good. I trusted it all, you know, use me. Uh, but they s selected me to be a medic. And I didn't really want to be a medic, you know, mm -hmm. because 
That's not really what I thought about being a soldier. But it turns out that in Special Forces, medics are not non-combatants. Most of the Special Forces medics are already trained in one of the military occupational specialties, usually light or heavy weapons. I was a light weapons man. And the medical training is over a year. So it was over a year of very specific, uh, very hard, very academic medical training. Our instructors were all surgeons or doctors of one specialty or another, or nurse practitioners, laboratory technicians. We learned laboratory techniques, nursing techniques. We learned dentistry. We learned uh, OBGYN. We, uh, we worked in hospitals. We uh, assisted in uh, deliveries and births and uh, um, abdominal abdominal surgeries. We we learned how to suture. We learned how to to do a physical examination. We learned many aspects of medical uh, practice. Uh, eventually, when we came out of it a year later, if we made it, everybody didn't make it. It was very tough training. It was another incentive. If you dropped out or failed in medical training you're out of special forces and by then the Vietnam War was hot and heavy and everybody was going to Vietnam everybody knew we were going to Vietnam and a lot of people were dying in Vietnam and most people that dropped out of my class were shipped immediately to the 173rd or 101st Airborne Division and just sent straight to Vietnam with some line unit where they were thrown into the jaws of battle and by that time you know I was no longer wanting to just go, <laughs> don't really throw me into the jaws of battle. I'm, I'm cool with this training. You know, I was learning some really good uh, techniques, medical techniques. So um, anyway, uh, we went through dog lab at the very end of our training. We had a, a, a tropical disease specialist who came in from, I think he was from New Orleans, Louisiana, and he taught us all about different kinds of tropical diseases. And we also had were issued a dog that was to be euthanized from a local pound. And we were they would take the sickest dogs and issue each one of us a dog. And we lived with that dog day and night. We cleaned his teeth. We did laboratory work. We could tell you what kind of worms he had, what kind of um, venereal diseases he may have had, what kind of mange. Anything that this dog had, we had to cure it. And our graduation depended upon us accurately take you know effectively taking care of this dog so that was dog lab at the same time we're learning tropical diseases um, towards the end of our medical training with dog lab they would put the dog to sleep as if it were being in uh, uh, well, not to sleep permanently, but we put it down with sodium pen and switch it over to ether because it's easier and safer to keep somebody at a certain level of consciousness for surgery when they're on ether as opposed to sodium pentothal, which take you down fast, but it's dangerous to stay down at that third level of consciousness. I can't remember the terms anymore for a long period of time. So we take them down on sodium pen, switch them over to ether. I would be the anesthetist on one of my buddy's dogs, he'd be the surgeon, okay, and they would take the dog and they'd shoot it in the, in the thigh, one of the, the rear thigh legs, and we would get practice um, treating a fresh gunshot wound because the, uh, the muscle tissue of a dog is very similar to human muscle tissue. So we got a lot of really good practice basically excising uh, necrotic tissue to prevent infections and put in drains and and then we took care of this dog and brought him back to health and everything and uh, meanwhile we're going through all of our other training and uh, getting ready for Vietnam we all were going to Vietnam for sure we knew that that was what was happening and um, some of us actually went to Panama or to Germany but mostly we went to Vietnam dog lab was pretty heavy and in, uh, intensive uh, experience I fell in love with my dog. <laughs> His name was Tygo from the honey-colored crust of Impa Tygo. <laughs> and uh, he was like a shepherd mix. And uh, I, I saved my dog, basically. I smuggled him out. And the only way I smuggled him out was because my buddy, I was his anesthetist, my buddy went through the final 
it's a surgical procedure where you amputate your dog's leg and you have like two surgeons coming in and they're observing every single aspect of your you're the surgeon but they're grading you and, you know you're all smocked up and you know you're pretending to be a surgeon you're actually functioning as a surgeon so I did that uh, with, with my my buddy's dog I was the anesthetist and then rather than putting his dog to sleep we would usually give him an intracardial injection of sodium pentothal put him sleep when the procedure was over and then we would uh, put him in a special Dempsey dumpster outside and it would be taken away to be disposed of. And it was very controversial at the time. There was a lot of news about it and SPCA and everybody who was against the war or the army or anything was totally against it. So it was secret at the time for us. But it was invaluable training. We really did need that mm -hmm. hands-on experience. And these dogs were all doomed to begin with. You know, we tried to be comfy with it. But anyway, when it came time to, um, the surgeon went to the next OR. We had an old hospital there at Fort Bragg. So they had three operating rooms. Mm -hmm. And he would be going, he had one operating room going on. Uh, and when one would finish, he'd go to the next one. And we'd have them staged while we prepped the other patient for his amputation. Rather than putting my dog to sleep, well, rather than putting my buddy's dog to sleep, we just flipped him over and prepped his other hind leg. And so with all the surgical drapes, you didn't know. You know, they didn't, the, the surgeons, they didn't know what dog was what. It was just the, the leg under the lights, you know, and it had three medics around it working on it. We had a circulating nurse and an anesthetist and a surgeon. And um, so we did my buddy's dog's other hind leg for mine, and I successfully did it. And I put my dog down with a sedative and put him in a special box and smuggled him out into the Dempsey dumpster next to the one with the other dogs. And it was a Friday afternoon, and I had the weekend off. And I came back around in my Class A uniform and got my box and got a buddy to give me a ride out to Southern Pines in North Carolina. I took him out in the woods, gave him an injection to undo the the sedative that I had given him and hitchhiked down to Savannah, Georgia with him. Motorcycle, Hell's Angels picked us up, took us all the way from uh, south of the border, the North Carolina, South Carolina line, all the way down to the Talmadge Bridge in Savannah. And I walked home and gave him to my family and, you know, my you know, little Tygo. Yeah, that was kind of cool. But anyway, so I graduated from Special Forces Medics training and I was assigned to the 3rd Special Forces Group it, and I'm now a Spec 4, E4 and I had a beret with a flash and a crest and I would completed all of my training and, I'm re and they're going to do with me what they will and what they did is they assigned me to a team that went up to Dahlonega, Georgia for mountain ranger training so I became one of the instructors on a team of instructors for um, the mountain ranger training which is basically repelling and how to rig up uh, heavy duty ropes and cables to go across chasms and you know, it was all exciting we would do night jumps from 500 feet with equipment you know we'd lay out a we'd, we'd take a field and we we knew how to lay out a certain um, markers according to an azimuth and be talking on the radio and have a small plane come in at night we'd light the the little fires you know in the in the can of sand with gas or kerosene as markers and they would we would we would jump into that okay and then they would go the lights would be out and our counterparts would meet us and we'd go sneak around through the woods and meet up with our team of uh, of gorillas basically these are guys that had just uh, finished up um, at West Point, they're all fresh second lieutenants that were going through the ranger training. So we did that, and it was kind of fun going through the mountains of uh, Georgia and uh, North Carolina, actually, Smoky Mountains. And um, then I got orders to go to Vietnam, and so I uh, I had been in the army almost two years now, and it all been training of one kind or another. And um, I got, I arrived in Vietnam on a, basically a troop ship, which was actually an airplane, a big wide body 
I think it was a 747. They just came came up with those. It had stairways. You could go upstairs inside the airplane. I was fascinated by that. And I forget where I left from. I some place on the West Coast, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco. I don't know. But I arrived in um, Cameron Bay, Vietnam, in December of 1967. And it was hot. And it smelled like shit burning, because that's what was happening everywhere. People were burning big 55-gallon drums where human waste would be mixed with kerosene, and then you light it, and somebody be stirring it, and gives out smoke. Usually they hired locals to do that, or they put um, some one of our, the million troops that were there, I think there was half a million of us there at that time, uh, we'd have the shit detail basically burning shit so I don't know we were in Vietnam and uh, I was kind of excited about it because my impression well I was afraid actually of dying I didn't want to die and I had to get accustomed to that probability or possibility anyway before I went to Vietnam but now I'm there and Actually, let me back up a little bit. There was a significant incident on my way to Vietnam that is worth mentioning. They wouldn't let anybody off of the airplane when we landed at Cameron Bay because, and so the MPs, the military police, came out and surrounded it with jeeps and stuff, and they came up on the airplane. They came on the airplane and they were going down the aisles and they and I had been sitting next to a Special Forces sergeant who'd been in Vietnam already. And I was trying to pick his brain to see, you know, what can I learn? You know, I thought we were going over to help our Vietnamese allies, you know, resist the communist oppressors that were coming in from the north. Or the Viet Cong who were who had three man assassination teams in every village in Hamlet taking names and taking people out. That's what I had heard. And it was actually true, but anyway, I'm sitting next to the sergeant and they came in and they arrested him and took him off. And it turns out that what had happened was that back at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, his wife had been having an affair with somebody else. And he had gone home on emergency leave and had um, evidently, he was a demo man, he'd rigged the bed in their bedroom with a pressure release device because he didn't believe that his wife was not cheating on him. Well, she was cheating on him. And and while he was en route back to Vietnam, uh, she and her, her lover blew themselves up, you know. And so they figured it must have been him that did it. So they were waiting for him when he got to Vietnam. That was, okay, um, welcome to Vietnam. Mostly it was hot and uh, I remember when we finally left Cameron Bay on a truck going up to Natrang that I'm, well, they just issued everybody an M1 carbine, a really small uh, rifle, lightweight rifle, uh, just to have a rifle, I guess, while you're going through enemy territory uh, from Cameron Bay up, up to Natrang. I remember being in the back of this truck looking at the Vietnamese people whom I had learned. I had learned some Vietnamese. I had learned the culture. I had, I had been instructed by Vietnamese in Fort Bragg, you know, getting in preparation for Vietnam, especially medical terms. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at these people and expecting them to really um, appreciate us Americans being there for them, like this, ready and willing to die, you know, for their for them. Mm -hmm. But all I saw was looks of absolutely pure hatred. Old women would be looking at me and I would smile, you know. I'm fresh faced, naive kid trying to do good. You know. And they looked like they hated us. And that was a sort of a just a mental check point, check mark that I made to sort of compare difference between expectation and reality, one of them. 
later I met a lot of Vietnamese people who really loved us and cared about us a lot, but it all depends upon which side they were on. You know, it was a whole big civil thing going on there. Anyway, so I got up to Nha Trang and um, I took, uh, I bought a camera. And here is the first picture I took with my Yashica 135mm camera that I bought at the PX there in Nha Trang. I'm walking back towards our base and I saw these guys filling sandbags and I figured out how to use the, the little spring-loaded self-aperture uh, release and took this picture. It's my first picture and I took quite a few of them pictures during the whole time I was in Vietnam. And this is the second picture I took which is of some of my classmates, new Special Forces medics in the train waiting to be assigned to some other part of the country. And I'm in the middle squatting down after I had set it up and ran back to get in front of it before the spring-loaded release. So that was your barracks behind you? I, it was a transit barracks okay. at the Special Forces SFOB, Special Forces Operational Base in the train, Vietnam, in 1967, mid-December. <clears throat> and um, I was shipped up to the northern part of I-Corps. Uh, and I went to Da Nang and I was assigned to the field hospital in Da Nang and the field hospital in Da Nang in I Corps was the special forces B team so to speak that supplied all the A teams that were around in the I Corps area and A team is 12 special forces guys on a very remote campsite out near a border area or in a heavily contested area with the Viet Cong or the NVA and usually they would have villages and so we would work with the villagers and they would we would organize them we would train them and we'd arm them I would be their medic <clears throat> and we would assist them on operations and so from the field hospital in the train I mean I'm sorry in Da Nang I became accustomed to being in the country. I learned what was happening at some of the other camps. I did med caps at one of the other camps, uh, one out at Thong Duck. I've got some pictures of that, I think. Um, I went on a couple of operations with what's called a mic force, which goes out to engage the enemy, um, but I didn't see much action there at all. Um, I did do a lot of uh, work in the hospital. My daily routine was like being a nurse in a hospital and I assisted a doctor. Uh, Doc Hunter was the one doctor that I remember working with and um, we had burn patients. I had my first, uh, my first medevac was a, a small seven-year-old Vietnamese boy and from the village of Thong Duc that had been burned over about only about 20% of his body but it was severe and it was in his face so he could have inhaled it and it was you know it, basically a kerosene stove had been filled with gasoline and it exploded they didn't know any different and he was in bad shape so I met a him and um, we saved him we did skin grafts on him everything it was really cool because we were able to take uh, like skin from his thigh, inner thigh, we just take with a scalpel very carefully we, we would take the top layer of skin after the capillary bud started to form on the burn you know and you have a pseudomonas inspection you have to take care of that every day you have to take it off it's very painful and this little kid would just go I mean I'd be screaming vaguely you know but he took it and we we kept the infection down. We did the capillary buds, and we put little pieces of skin on top of it, and it would take and grow. It was great. Le Nhi was his name. I became close friends with him. I got him some tomato plants, and we had a little garden growing underneath his bed in the hospital room. His mama came all the way in from the countryside, the distant countryside, to visit him. Brought back his twin sister who had the measles, and we treated her. And his dad had been a Viet Cong. He kind of you know, it was kind of the hearts and minds dynamic that worked really well, I, th I thought. In my mind it was. And um, in late December of, of 67, a lot of fighting had been happening at the other camps around I-Corps. 
and uh, a significant incident that I recall before the Tet Offensive began actually was when um, we got a call late at night from the NSA hospital down the road from us, Naval Support Activity Hospital. That was the center place where all the Marine casualties would come in from around I Corps. That was the Marines were in the northern part of South Vietnam at the time, I Corps. And that was their headquarters right there by Marble Mountain, the beach mm -hmm. outside of Da Nang. There was a naval support activity hospital with surgeons and lab retory works and you know the intensive care unit and the post ops and it was a it was a main center well our compound was only two miles down the road the special forces compound and our little field hospital but we you know took patients from our aid camps and treated them and you know sent them back out we got a call for all the medics drunk to get on a truck that pulled up and uh so, so I did, with a bunch of other guys. We went out, went down the road at night, and nobody knew what was happening. The guy in the truck climbs out, yells back at us that what's happening is that there's so many casualties coming in from around i of dead Marines. There's so many dead bodies stacked up around the intake place for NSA hospital that the, hot, that the ships with fresh casualties that needed to be treated live ones couldn't land. They needed somebody just to move bodies out of the way. So that's what we did. We went in there and we filled the truck up with bodies and moved out of space, enough space for um, helicopters to land. One of them ran out of fuel before that happened and it was, it was pretty bad. It was, it was just a lot of dead people. Uh, but we, we cleared it away and we took most of them back to our compound and um, kept them because uh, graves registration at the uh, the main graves registration was overwhelmed by casualties and so um, we put them in the coolers you know we had a reefer we had electricity we had an air conditioned office our colonel's office the day room the the uh, the mess hall that had a reefer uh, even the shower in our medical um, in our little field hospital there, concrete floor, we could keep them cool because it was, you know, until graves registration we have a chance to catch up to them. I uh, wrote a story about that. Yeah, I might send it later or something. But anyway, that was, got my impression, you know, like, wow, this really is war. You know, this really is what war is all about. There's just a lot of dead people and all of the activity that was going on around me was in order to make more people dead. You know, whether it was the enemy, I mean, the enemy had killed these people. Uh, most of them, the ones that, that we took back were Korean rock Marines. Uh, I think Graves Registration had focused on the U.S. Marines first. But anyway, that was a significant event. Then, um, there was the Tet Offensive began and there was an awful lot of uh, fireworks around the mountains, you know, there were um, explosions, there were people trying to come into our compound, there was alerts, uh, <coughs> there were some close calls going to treat some of our guys across the river in Da Nang City and then get back with us trying to get back into uh, to our compound. I remember that Quezon was a place up in the northern part of i Corps was becoming under siege. There was an A camp, A101 at Lang Bay where some of my buddies were attached, it had just been overrun. Uh, and so there was a big, there were a lot of refugees that were coming in trying to escape the NVA, the invading North Vietnamese mm -hmm. Army and the Viet Cong. Viet Cong had their main headquarters up there and they were really brutal. Uh, they took names and then they would just go kill you know, your family. If you work for the South Vietnamese government or you were friends or not one of them, you were dead. And uh, I heard tales about, you know, mass casualties up in Hue City. It was, um, but myself and two other medics, uh, Dale Lee and Willie Cripps, were assigned to go up to Quezon 
and help with all the refugees that had been gathering at, to Quezon to friendly, there was an airstrip there, mm -hmm. to get out. And NVA, the enemy, surrounded the whole area. I mean, the road was closed, uh, all the bridges were blown, anybody that was working with us was dead if they weren't already in there. So that's where we were going to try to help uh, facilitate the evacuation of these, uh, of these refugees. So um, that was a real scary experience because the three of us had to hitchhike. We had to wait for somebody to find an aircraft that was willing to go into Quezon, which was being shot at by 37 millimeter anti-aircraft fire. They'd already shot down one C-130 and numerous other aircraft with a lot of people getting killed during that effort. So <clears throat> basically what they did is we went out to the Da Nang base and they put us on a C-123, which is a small two-engine cargo airplane that had jet assist rockets, so it can like take off faster or you know it can maneuver faster than a heavy lumbering Hercules C-130. And we flew around Quezon. I looked down. I could see it happening. I could see the crashed airplanes, and the pilot flew us down through the clouds. I mean, it was like heavy duty. We had a, one pallet that we were hanging onto the straps for as we're going down, right? And it sounded like a typewriter was tapping on the outside of the aircraft. It was actually like, it was type of typewriter with sledgehammers for keys. It actually was the, it was the uh, anti-aircraft fire that was hitting the fuselage and going through it. And we got down and we slowed down and turned around and the, he never stopped. He lit out the uh, parachute and he lit out the pallet and he turned around at one place and the three, four of us, actually there was a second lieutenant also with us, three medics, and a second lieutenant ran off the back of the aircraft. And um, I saw a Marine with hold his helmet and his flag jacket yelling, you know, come this way. So I went that way, ran towards him and the little puffs of uh, mortar rounds, the enemy's mortar rounds were, I thought they were trying to shoot me, but it was just the airplane they were trying to shoot. I went off to the side and I got under these bags, but they were, they were dead Marines, basically, been there for a week. You know, they hadn't been able to get them out. It was, but it was the only cover there was. So I recall that being quite a um, significant reminder that you know this is serious business here, and it's, it was pretty, pretty putrid smell. And eventually, uh, the plane left. <clears throat> the uh, artillery, incoming artillery, and the mortars stopped. And I went over to the edge of the compound and I found the Special Forces, had a little Special Forces uh, Ford Observation Base, FOB-3. And this was a unit that provided, that did reconnaissance patrols in Laos and North Vietnam along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So it was top secret because we weren't really supposed to be in Laos, you know, or North Vietnam. But then neither, well, I guess you can't say that North Vietnamese weren't supposed to be in North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. but they also were not supposed to be in Laos, but they were major. They took over the whole area. So there was a whole other war happening right over there. Okay. Meanwhile, the North Vietnamese are coming in with tanks. They got the place surrounded by troops. There's one five two millimeter artillery uh, dug into the mountains to the west of Quezon, a uh, place called Co Rock Mountain. They had radar guided anti aircraft 37 Mike Mikes, you know, shooting down anything in the sky that was, uh, that was, uh, that was ours, and um, they were trying to kill us. And so I ended up there for, it must have been about a week or 10 days. And basically, I was helping facilitate all these civilian refugees. Basically, we just immunized them and took care of any medical problems we have. And whenever we could organize any kind of an airlift out, I would escort them or me and, the, and the, my other two buddies would take groups of them over to catch this airplane. It had to be carefully coordinated mm -hmm. because each time an airplane landed, the artillery started and the mortars and anything else the enemy felt like shooting at us you know so it was like really a kind of a a, a tough knit uh, situation but we got them all out most of them out anyway i think we got all of them out actually it, uh, there were quite a few um there were several hundred uh, at least 
that we took care of during that period. And I also got out of there, okay? And went back to Da Nang, and the Tet Offensive is still ongoing, and there's war happening everywhere. And um, <clears throat> I got assigned to an A camp, Kim Duck. Oh well, I can tell you these pictures later. But anyway, um, so I was, this, is, this was kind of cool for me because it's away from the populated area. This is what I've been trained for. I got to be the village doctor, nurse, dentist, uh, pharmacist for everybody in Camduck. And the, the American team was supposed to have two medics, but there was, I was the only one. They were all gone. So I was the only medic for a while. I only stayed there for a few weeks, but during those few weeks I delivered my first baby, which was a breach and bad, but it came out okay. And uh, it was a little boy, and it was really pissed off to <laughs> And uh, it, it was kind of cool, but, um, and there was a lot of also, the, the war was still, was happening around there as well. There were quite a few wounded that I ended up taking care of. Uh, not right at the moment, you know, I didn't catch them, but uh, I had my own operating room there and my two nurses, which we knew a lot, this, these nurses had been working with the French and with the Vietnamese and with other Americans and they've been well trained and it was kind of really cool. I had, I, I really got along well with them, both Kohun and Kosun. Actually, yeah, okay, here's Kohun. And here's another little nurse that was in training uh -huh. at uh, the camp called Cam Duck. Cam Duck. And uh, they were pretty cool people. And I've got a picture here of Cam Duck also. Uh, oh, here it is. This is Cam Duck. And there's a mountain in the background. The old Highway 14 was a, uh, a road that had been in disrepair since the French left there. So. It was just elephants and tigers and the North Vietnamese Army. They were building a road in to, to do that. It was very isolated. It was only accessible by air. And I left there in uh, March, sometime in March, probably the very end of March or first part of April of 1968. And it was finally overrun by the NVA in uh, May of May the 10th. Or May the 12th of 1968. Several of my friends, a lot of my friends died there, including those nurses, all of them, a whole airplane full of, uh, all the civilians were shot down and crashed, burned, it was horrible. Uh, and I'm glad I wasn't really there when that happened. I had, had left to go somewhere else. And, uh, the place that I left to go to was back to Quezon which was still under siege. And so, um, couldn't really get in by air yet. It, uh, it had gotten worse at Quezon. And um, there were some, uh, first cavalry division was fighting its way up Highway 9. Uh, and I ended up working my way up from Da Nang to Hue City where I saw the, they were exhuming the mass graves where the NVA had killed all these civilians when they took over the citadel of Hue. So uh, I, uh, I recall, I re made a significant impact on me to see all these, all these dead people, civilians, kids with just, you know, little um, bamboo straps behind their back and they had, I don't know, they killed them. I didn't want to get into it too much. We were scattering lime over them mainly. Other people were, I just observed it. I'm trying to get to Quezon, and I'm going with the, the troop movements. The bridges had been blown, so I remember we took a, uh, like a U.S. Navy um, assault ship that Marines would use, you know, in the Second World War, and go up the river to Dong Ha. And at Dong Ha, I remember um, going from there to a place called Kalu, not Kalu, uh, someplace near Kamlo village. The 1st Cavalry Division uh, had been pulled in from other parts of the country to do a major push up Highway 9 to relieve the siege at Quezon. So I was with that column of the 1st Cavalry Division 
uh, and we got into Quezon on about the 10th, I think, of April of 1968. So I was there for that. And, um, you know, there was a lot of fighting, but I didn't really see it. I just heard it. You know, it'd be like a couple hundred meters off to the side, and we had gunships and stuff that would sort of suppress that fighting. And when we got to Quezon, um, I went back to my old place. There I was. I knew those guys. Uh, some of the finest medics I ever met in my in the in the world in my life were there. Just some of the biggest-hearted, most gentle, generous human beings that you can imagine meeting. I I met them again. There they were. They were soldiers surviving this siege. And uh, I remember the truck driver or the assistant truck driver on the truck I was in, which was like the third truck back that made it through, uh, that relieved that siege, I had a sucking chest wound. Some, you know, artillery came in and a piece of shrapnel punctured his lung. And you've got to be really careful when that happens. You have to seal the puncture or the air will come in and deflate the lung, fill it with air, and then you're just, you're blowing bubbles basically and you're not getting any oxygen exchange. So that was a big deal. We took him down in the medical bunker and we did our SF medic number and, you know, our, our surgical procedure. And uh, and he was, we evacu evacuated him out. Uh, there was a helicopter now. Now that we had arrived, meaning the 1st Cavalry Division and the U.S. had come on the, on the road, and we had gunships and aircraft, and the enemy was backed off. They still had their artillery from Korok Mountain, which was about seven kilometers to our west. But you had plenty of lead time, because you could always hear the, if you're quiet, you can hear the, the artillery round leaving its tube in the distance, like boom, boom, boom. So you've got about five or to seven seconds to run and find a place to get down. So it was that was the only thing you really had to worry about too much there at the time because the enemy had left their trenches or at least they weren't. We didn't see them. They you know they weren't making themselves known or you know first cavalry division <laughs> moved them back a little bit. You know mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it was a lot of war happening there and it had been happening there and um. So I stayed at Quezon there uh, until June. So April, May, and June of 1968, I was there at Quezon. And I have some pictures of Quezon area. I might show you these pictures later. I'm kind of, it's hard for me to go through this without um, you know, keeping, my, keeping my focus uh, on the interview. Anyway, um, so, uh, at Quezon, it was kind of quiet. All I really had to do, I mean, I'm living in the medical bunker now. I had been out in the trenches before. And um, uh, whenever enemy would assault us, usually we would notice, you know, and we would, they would get killed. And they would just lay there and rot. So there was a lot of rats and um, I knew the enemy had left their trenches at Quezon because uh, all of a sudden we were overwhelmed with rats. There were rats everywhere. Basically when the enemy left their trenches, the rats that had been living with them and eating from their uh, leftovers came all the way over to our uh, trench line. And so we used to have rat drives and the mountain yards, the mountain people that were the mercenaries that worked for us there at the time, they loved rats. So they, you know, because we were only eating sea rations, you know, and there was very little water because the enemy had the water supply too. So anyway, there was an overwhelming abundance of fresh food right here. And the, and the Americans were, most of us, of us, well, we were special forces, you know, we could like <laughs> snake eaters and all that stuff. But I'm telling you, if you properly clean a rat and cook it well with the right seasoning, I can't, it, there, it's like, it's hard to find anything that tastes better than that. Especially maybe being hungry might be an incentive, but 
I mean, you can really do some really wonderful things with rodent meat. And so, which we did. The mountain yards would have rat drives where we'd take a big rattan uh, matting and put it at the end of one of the trench line and, the, and a couple other guys would be standing off the side of the top of the trench with blankets with weights on the end of them. We'd go down with pots and pans and helmets and bang, 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 and, you, and drive the rats down to the end and then they'd throw blankets over them, jump down and bang them and kill them, you know, and then an hour later, man, this most wonderful aroma would be wafting through the, the, the area. And that was kind of cool. I mean, you know, an unusual experience. Also drew the snakes. Big cobras would come in because they love rats. So it was kind of cool. We had some pet cobras, basically, mm -hmm. that we liked nurturing those pet cobras. We didn't want anybody to mess with them because they were taking, the, they, you know, they were eating rats. But I remember that one day, one of the mountain yards, the brew, their tribe, they killed the cobra, you know. And so, oh man, you know, they killed the cobra. There's a pair of them. And they, the story was, I don't know if it's true, they mate for life, you know, and the other one would be coming to look for whoever it was. So from then on, we couldn't even sleep in the trenches or the bunkers, really, because we were always worried about the dead <laughs> cobra coming looking for his mate. Rats would wake you up nibbling on your mouth, you know. I'm serious. There was more than once in my bunker, uh, there was a guy that was kind of crazy. I think he might have lost it, but I, you just wake up, there's explosions happening all over the place because he just couldn't take it anymore. He wakes up and he's shooting inside the bunker. He's shooting rats, you know, with a little red uh, flashlight and a, but it was, he was only shooting with a 45, but still it's loud, you know. It's, mm -hmm. and, uh, Eventually, we somebody uh, went home to get a BB or a pellet gun. I don't know if he ever got it, but you know, we left there by then, I think. Um, so, the case on we just kind of they rotated everybody who had been there through most of the siege, and um, we were done. I think uh, President uh, Johnson was president, and he declared case on a victory, and we evacuated. <laughs> the enemy actually kicked our ass and but it got declared a victory on our part so we left okay and we went about I don't know seven or eight clicks to the south and reestablished a new FOB 3 down in a place called Mylock in the Kua Valley where then we began building a new camp and we had taken all the refugees that had we that I had helped evacuate earlier they'd been down at a refugee camp near Camlo we bought them some uh, or leased them some some rice patties with fresh spring water and their health improved immediately mm -hmm. they were no longer dependent upon you save rice you know which is you know uh, refined rice they had regular old homegrown you know patty rice basically brown rice and their health improved a lot and they had meat and stuff and they weren't being ripped off by the Vietnamese officials who were in charge of all of the um, assistance that we would send them, they were all co-opted by the Viet Cong anyway. It turns out that the entire headquarters for the National Liberation Army, the N well NLF with National Liberation Front, was in a place called Cam Lo. I found this out decades later, but no wonder we thought everybody was being co-opted because they were anyway. Um, the mountain yards started to thrive. They were healthy. We set up this camp. I got to be doctor and dentist, and but I had to go on operations also around right in the area. Like I said, special forces medics are not non-combatants. Mm -hmm. Most of us had already been trained with weapons, and uh, so I would carry a weapon and go on patrols and do the the soldier's job, basically, and um, the NVA were becoming more and more evident around us again. I mean, we'd only gone five or six clicks to the south of where they'd been anyway. I mean, it was an illusion to think we're going back to the rear because, <laughs> like, you know, it, they were all over the place. Uh, and I participated in some night ambushes and actually uh, killed NVA soldiers during those operations. And um, my unit started uh, 
sending reconnaissance teams out into Laos. Basically, seven men recon teams would be inserted into the ground and uh, in the middle of an NVA army, you know, being shot at with radar controlled 37 Mike Mike uh, NAR, you know, anti aircraft artillery. It was really hairy stuff, and a lot of guys died. And uh, each one of those teams, when it would be inserted, they would have a Special Forces medic, me or one of my buddies, on another helicopter. Uh, they would go in to help, call it Chase Medic. We would be the chase ship. They go in and they do their thing. We would be high up. If they ran into trouble on the insert and somebody got wounded, then we could go down and help them get out. And also, you'd have a medic to treat them. So, always rigged up the helicopters with uh, with ropes, you know, for lifting them out if there were too many trees. We also, um, I'd have IVs already hung. You know, I think we use Ringer's lactate and. Uh, and a lot of bandages and airways and stuff like that to maintain um, functioning, you know, treat chest and abdominal wounds, gunshot wounds. Mm -hmm. And I had to do that often, almost every time actually. Uh, and um, so the war just went on and on and on and on like that. At my lock, friends died. Um, the enemy was killed. Uh, I mean, you know, it was it was it was a it was a war. And then um, in um, August of 1968, August the 19th, actually, I've got a picture of that one too. I'll show you later. I was on a night ambush, and I I was wounded, and um, I recently got an award. You know, Bronze Star for that action after, you know, 20 or something, well, 40 something years after the fact. Because during one of the reunions I went to, some of the people that were there, you know, articulated what had happened and put it through the channels, and, you know, you get old awards and decorations. That has happened subsequently, but um, that was on the 19th of August. On the 25th, 2nd of August, 23rd of August, 1968, I was sent down to Da Nang, to Marble Mountain, to FOB 4 at the base of Marble Mountain, for a promotion board. But it just so happened that during that particular time, all of the special ops people, which I was part of then, all the special ops people were coming to FOB 4 at Marble Mountain because they were rotating back to the States or their enlistments had retired or like me, they were coming down for promotion board, some administrative service. But the 22nd and 23rd of August was a new moon night. There's no moon. And I felt really strange. I had, I'm not really familiar with that FOB. And I, I just had that hair on the back of your neck feeling. I didn't like it, but I had to be there for a promotion board the next day. So I requested to go spend the night at a safe house in Da Nang City, and did. And that night, the camp was overrun completely. NVA Sapper Squad came in, killed more Special Forces soldiers than had been killed any time in the history of Special Forces. 17 of my friends and buddies, and some of them weren't even buddies, but you know, they were associates. And uh, they blew up the radio station in Da Nang City next door to where the safe house was. And a squad of NVA came in, but they didn't, I, I hid. And uh, I, they didn't see me. And um, I didn't know what was going on anyway till the next morning when I went out. I went back out to the camp and there's dead bodies everywhere. I got there just at the break of daylight. And uh, the, there's nobody on the gate guard, you know, there's smoke rising, an explosion happening. Some two guys had blown themselves up in a, in a shit house that uh, had a tin roof. So there were 17 dead Americans, about 25 of our dead indig, and 40 dead of the, um, of the NVA sappers that were all killed. There was a big, bloody battle. And several of my friends were killed and uh, others were wounded and um, it was kind of a heavy duty scene and I luckily you know I wasn't scratched really <laughs> uh, and I don't know how I did on the promotion board either because I remember uh, 
Actually, I remember I was taking care of all the dead, basically trying to get the right body in the right pile so I can put the right tag, name tag, so it goes to the right survivor back home. And there was three guys in the combo bunker that was having trouble distinguishing when somebody came and pulled me away from that as a staff sergeant from another Special Forces compound nearby. Angry at me because I was late for my promotion board. I'd gotten distracted by being overrun in this big battle, but they didn't know that. They came and got me in the middle of it and took me for the promotion board. And I had a, you know, I went before the board with human grease and, uh, you know, reeking of of this work I've been doing and uh, I think I had an attitude I actually did get promoted to buck sergeant but I didn't know about it till I got home nobody ever told me you know there was chaotic all of the records and all the people in charge for keeping account of things have been blown up they're gone they were dead or it was just it wasn't put together until many many years later uh, like I said about two years ago Anyway, so then I went back to um, to Mylock, and I can I flew Chase on Chase missions. I took care of the Indig people through uh, September. I remember my 22nd birthday was September the 29th, and uh, I remember my one of my buddy's team came out on the 28th. They'd been holed up in North Vietnam. They made it out alive, thank goodness. But. Um, the mountain yards on my team, a picture of them here, celebrated my 22nd birthday for me. You know, they did a special ceremony, and it was horrible. It was horrible. But the mountain yards, the brew, are animistic tribe, and they are very brutal. And they felt like the spirit or the animus of an animal, if it's experiencing pain, is an honor to who it's being dedicated to. So they took a chicken. And they just built a fire with his legs lashed together and started flopping this chicken over the fire, burning his feathers off. And it was all a big honor for me for my birthday. And I couldn't, I, I mean, I'm begging them, I'm like, please let me kill it, anything, you know, stop this chicken. But they went ahead and did the chicken until it, you know, it, it was gone. It was an honor for my 22nd birthday. And, uh, so that was September and October, October 31st. Uh, I traded places with Matson and he got blown up and uh, he was a good friend of mine. He'd been on the same hatchet force. And uh, in November, I remember a bunch of guys that I traded places with, they got killed. They went out on a mission and uh, got shot down. Uh, helicopters got shot down from three or 4,000 feet uh, over Laos. I know right where it was. Uh, I had been there earlier on a on a reconnaissance mission. I had gone out with uh, one reconnaissance mission. They had needed a volunteer to take the place of a guy who was late coming back from R&R &R or something, which I don't blame him for staying in R&R, &R, but uh, it was pretty heavy duty. We got a POW, we brought him back, and we turned him over. But to get out of there, we had been picked up by a, a ladder that's dropped over the side of a helicopter. Mm. It's like a 20-foot ladder just uh, with uh, three cables, you know, with um, plastic covering on them and then little aluminum slats. And they had dropped the ladder down and I'm at the very bottom of the ladder and I clipped onto the ladder. And there was one other, the team leader was right above me so I couldn't move. They dragged us through the trees and the guy was firing his machine gun and the hot bullets were coming down inside my shirt. And I thought I was being shot, but it was actually just the hot shells from the guy who was excited. You know, I guess, I don't know what he was shooting at. So I thought we were, you know, I didn't think there was anybody shooting at us, but I don't know. I thought it was being shot. So I just clipped on to the thing and the helicopter pilot went up and up and up and he told me he went over 10,000 feet, as high as a helicopter can go. And this was a new D model Huey, a heavier engine, and that was to get over the anti-aircraft fire. And I could see the anti-aircraft fire because I'm at the bottom of this ladder hanging, well I'm not hanging, I'm clipped in. I've got a rope and I'm clipped with a snap link and I'm hanging <laughs> and I'm hoping you know I'm just like freezing my 
you know, I'm cold. But I remember these little blue-gray puffs of smoke just kept appearing right beneath my feet. And it was the anti-aircraft, it was the upper, outer range of the anti-aircraft fire that they were shooting. He, these helicopter pilots, had gone over that. Subsequently, a week or two later, this other team I was telling you about where I switched places, they didn't know about that in an aircraft fire, and they flew right into it and shot them down. They were dead. There was about five guys, Special Forces guys, that some of them just knew in country, wanted to get out and do their thing, were killed there. So I got out of that one, okay. I remember from that ride, though, that we landed at Quezon, the old place where we had been under siege. Mm -hmm. There was a bare red clay runway. We had been at the outer range of the helicopters for fuel. So they landed at Quezon from that part of Laos near a place called Chepong, Lao, uh, T-C-H-E-P-O-N-E. Um, we landed so I could, me and the other guy could get on the helicopter. And we took off and went to a place called the Rock Pile. And, uh, but I remember there being an NVA flag at the Quezon, on the Quezon runway there. There was an NVA flag planted on the old Quezon airstrip. You know, there was like, it's theirs. Mm -hmm. There was, it was theirs. They would keep it too, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, anyway, uh, that was November. Then I got a, that was the 30th of November when those guys got shot down. And um, I was transferred from my lock, FOB 3, my lock, down to FOB 1, Fubai. So I got on the, when they went off to go get shot down, I got on another chopper and left to go down to Fubai. When I landed at Fubai, somebody runs up in a Jeep, throws me a bag of bandages and says, shipping, get on the King Bee. You, you know, they, they're shot down, you gotta go get them. So I got on the King Bee and I'm taken off to go do a, what's called a bright light mission to go pick up the guys that had been shot down from 3,000 feet, you know, already in the middle of an NVA army right where I knew what was waiting for me. And I'm telling you, that's the most scared I've ever been in my life. I was just absolutely petrified with terror. Once we got above the clouds and I'm just in the clouds and it's just me going to rescue all these guys, the pilots, the everybody. And I knew where we were going. I knew this was it. I'm done. This is it. Over. Finny. You know, just when they were sending me back down to Fubai, getting closer to rotating home. Um, you know, only got a month left, maybe. Um, but thankfully, they called that mission off before we... We got above Quezon and we're over Laos. I remember, I could tell from the mountain range, the karst, there's a, a very dramatic karst of mountains that you can orient yourself by between Laos and North Vietnam mm -hmm. or Vietnam. And uh, the helicopter turned around and went back and I'm just like, can't tell you how relieved I was yeah. to be able to go back to Fubai. So um, I stayed at Fubai for a week or two and uh, I think I did a couple of missions. I worked inside of the uh, dispensary there um, and I came home from Vietnam in 14 or so December of 1968. I, uh, I flew to, um, I got on an airplane and I can't remember where it was. I might have even been Saigon, the only time I was ever actually close to Saigon, at Tonsonu. I got on an airplane, a big airplane with stewardesses and everything on it and uh, all these other troopies and we flew to Japan. And I remember when we landed in Japan, there was a big black guy sitting next to me. I'm thrown in with all the guys from the regular army, you know, and there was this big black guy that had the aisle seat near the rear of the plane. It's the kind of airplane you have steps that you stepped out the back, mm -hmm. the very tail end, whatever type of plane that is. And um, he'd gone to the bathroom right before we landed. And he came back, sat down, and I thought he crashed. But I couldn't wake him up. He was dead. He was dead. He died of an overdose. Uh, he'd gone into the bathroom and had shot up something, I guess, and came, sat back down and died. So I said, oh man, okay. Let me, okay, this is cool. So, you know, we. They had, we all had to get off the plane 
and uh, you know they cleaned it up and everything. Then we got on a. I think we might even got back on the same plane. We did. We got back on the exact same plane, and um, we flew then to Ho Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska, and in Anchorage, Alaska, in December. 14th or 11th or whatever it was of 1968. It was cold. There were no other airplanes. The coffee shop was closed. They had put a plywood runway up to protect from the blowing wind, blowing like the Arctic Alaska wind would or, you know. The same airplane, the guy pushed me out of the way. I'm sitting in the rear of the plane. Remember I told you I was up by that rear seat? Now I've got the aisle seat. <laughs> Some other guy says, oh, let me out of the let me out of here. We're home American. He runs down the the runway, he kisses the ground, his lips stick. <laughs> and I just like, man, this is a trip. Okay, I I, I was just burnt. I'm done. Somebody else went to stick his lips. I just went, I, I went on into the bathroom. And I went into a stall in the bathroom and I, for the first time on American soil, relieved myself. And somebody had written on a toilet paper roll, today is the first day of the rest of your life and roll it back up again, man. And I like, whoa, check it out. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay. I hadn't heard that before. And, uh, but I remembered it. And then we flew to, uh, from there, we flew to Fort Lewis, Washington, but an airplane had crashed at their base there. So they closed that airstrip down and we had to land at SeaTac Airport in Seattle. And then we were gonna bus over to Fort Lewis to be discharged. And uh, I remember there was a, a protest, some kind of a war protest. I didn't know about war protests. I, I had no idea. I didn't know. I'd been insulated. All I knew was I'm on our side and the other guys that were trying to kill us are on the other side. You know, I didn't, you know, I was just doing my thing for my country the best I could. And, um, but this, I remember we were standing behind this chain link fence and I'm wearing a green beret and I mean, all these other guys are wearing these baseball caps. Okay, and uh, so I stood out, I guess, because she walked up to me. She was a really nice looking woman. She had on like a little, little fur collar coat, you know, and just looked like a really nice, you know, she, probably as old as my mom, maybe, you know, but I'm, I'm only 20, so she could have been in her 40s, you know, I don't know. And But she spat on my face and oh. said something really nasty to me, and it just blew me away. I couldn't understand why in the world she would do that, you know, this woman. I just, whoa, lady, take it easy, you know, I just wiped my face and... That was my first uh, inclination that maybe some, you know, what's this all about? Anyway, they busted us out of Fort Lewis, spent the night, took a shower. Next day we got issued new uniforms. I had a brand new uniform with medals. I looked probably sh more polished and shined than slick than I'd ever looked in the Army. And then I'm out of the Army. And I had a ticket home and uh, played. I had about 3000 bucks that I had saved up, I think. Yeah, I'd saved up about $3,000. Actually, I won it in a game. First time I ever played AC Ducey, I won it. And I kept it. And I never played again. Okay, that was okay. another story. Anyway, so um, I remember that I got my sister, one of my sisters, I have, like I said, seven siblings younger. One of my sisters had become a hippie and a folk singer and moved to California. And she lived in Santa Monica. And so I was going to go check in with her and say, hey, hey. And then I was going to fly back to New York City where I had a girlfriend named Lynn, whom I had been writing letters to and I'm all infatuated with. And I had a plan, you know, for life. You know, I'm going to get close to my girlfriend. I'm going to buy a motorcycle uh, and a pistol. Yeah, a good pistol. And I was going to get a Walther PP or baby PPK. And I'm going to go check out America. You know, see where I can be and live my life, you know, and do it. Um, but I was sick. I had some kind of rickettsial disease that had started to come over me. It's from all the rat urine and feces. It was probably, uh, well, I'm not sure which rickettsial disease, but it felt like malaria because I would have bouts of fever where it would come in bouts and then it would be relieved. And being a medic, you know, I knew all this. and. But I'm already out of the army. I've still got a uniform on. 
but I know where to go, what to do. So I just like gritting it through. So I ended up in San Francisco at the airport there by the TWA terminal. I remember there was a bar next to the TWA terminal in San Francisco. And uh, I was waiting for an airplane to somewhere on a very uncomfortable orange plastic bench. And I was sick and I'm shaking and I was dreaming. And I was dreaming that I was in a hut in Camduck delivering this baby. And what had happened during that period of time that the, the native women were blowing smoke on coals over the woman to chase away the evil spirits. Because it was a breech birth. And she was like, you know, the only showing was an arm. And it's like she's doomed to die a horrible, tragic death. And um, so they were blowing smoke, and I'm thinking that's what's going on in my, uh, well, like I said, I was having fevers, because I'm shattering, my teeth were like this. I'm having a nightmare, and I thought it was them blowing smoke on my face, but I opened my eyes, and there's this beautiful hippie girl. I could see her nipples through a sheer, <laughs> raspberry nipples through a sheer blouse, and they were blowing incense on me. <laughs> And I was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> but it, they weren't welcoming me. They were, they were starting to ostracize me and to put uh, me down because uh, I was a soldier and here it was in San Francisco. I didn't know San Francisco. I didn't know soldiers were that unpopular. And they were like saying some pretty nasty even mean you things were to sick. me. Uh, well, I didn't know. I was kind of delirious. I was that sick. Yeah. My fever was like, you know, it was heavy fever. And I just remember backing up and backing up and taking refuge and grabbing a chair and trying to keep them back because they were assaulting me physically. The young guys were. They were just thin, long, skinny, thin guys with wispy mustaches. And they were, you know, just the male version of the young babe who was there. And they, they really were, had latched onto me. I know there had to be other soldiers around, but they latched onto me. And I took refuge in the bar, that TWA, by the TWA terminal, until a policeman came. You know, I'm backing him off with a chair. I didn't want to, I don't want to, you know, leave me alone, you know, just, you know, do whatever you're going to do somewhere else. And uh, he wanted to know if I wanted to press charges. I, said, I don't even know what that means, but no, just leave me alone. Some young businessman bought me a drink in the bar. It was morning too, so it was early morning. So I, I waited till it was daylight there at that bar. Then I, somebody got me a drink. That was cool. And then I flew to San Fran or to L.A. I saw my sister, called my mom, called my uh, girlfriend. My mom was living in Savannah, still with six kids at home. She and my dad had divorced while I, right after I joined the Army. So I said, as the eldest child, Mom, is anything you want me to do before I'm off? I'm out of here. Yeah, I'm going to go do my life. I've got a lot of money, got a plan for a motorcycle. I got a girlfriend, you know. She says, yeah, help me move to California, get out of Savannah. So I said, okay, Mom. And so I flew to New York, found my girlfriend who was also a hippie now, living in a commune on the 15th floor of some apartment building in Greenwich Village, no less. And I'm still in uniform and like, I knocked on her door and there was a party going on inside the other side of the door and they just like, whatever, this guy with a uniform, is he in here? You know, so she, she says, oh my God. I says, hi, you know, took her down, we had dinner, I told her what I was gonna do, go to, Georgia to get my family moved to California. Did she want to come with me? It's okay. So we come home. I went to Georgia. My sister got a boyfriend with a Volkswagen bus. She moved, came to Savannah. We had a Volkswagen bus there. I helped my mom move, get rid of everything, sell the house, sell the furniture, give things away, pack up stuff, throw all the kids in the vehicle. I bought her TR6R. I had one at a Harley, but I didn't have enough money left now. But I got all used Triumph. And we caravan with two Volkswagen buses and my um, motorcycle to Santa Monica, California, dodging tornadoes all along the way. I remember that. And uh, I remember as soon as we crossed the California line, I got stopped by a policeman. First time I'd ever been stopped by a cop. 
the registration of my sister's hippie boyfriend on his VW bus had expired. That's why he wanted me to drive once we got to California. I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, I'll drive. <laughs> okay, and uh, we put the motorcycle in the van. Anyway, uh, so I got a ticket, and uh, he never fixed it, and I had to, you know, I had to deal with that. It was like really not cool. I thought it was, um, you know, I still remember that. <laughs> But we all set up the family in Santa Monica and, uh, you know, I went on off and did my thing with my girlfriend and uh, I wanted to be an actor. So I went to acting school on a GI Bill in, in uh, Hollywood. And, uh, but it was just, it was just too much of a ego scene and there was just too many people and it was just too sick of a scene and there's just too many damn people there. And uh, my girlfriend got pregnant and I had to do the right thing and I married her <laughs> and uh, actually we got married on June the 30th of 1969 oh, today's yeah. June the 30th right. of oh, 2015 but I divorced her seven years later <laughs> oh, yeah. two kids okay. seven years later and another hitch in the army oh, later yeah. uh, so I got work as a as a um, in the intensive care unit at Hollywood Community Hospital. I washed cars. I uh, went to school on the GI Bill. Here and there I joined a carpenter's union. I did odd jobs. I did whatever I could wherever I was. And I um, realized that this baby we were going to have, I didn't want our, this baby to grow up in Los Angeles. I mean, there's just too damn many people there. I mean, it's even Santa Monica, there's just too many people there. They ought to not let anybody in until two people leave. <laughs> but, so I, with all the money uh, I had, which was 80 bucks maybe, um, my wife with a child now, pregnant, you know, she was only three months by then, but we went looking for some place in the country to live and we ended up in West Yellowstone, Montana. And I lived in West Yellowstone, Montana for a year or so, doing every job there is to do there, which isn't much. Worked the sawmills until they got so cold the machinery wouldn't work. Then I worked for a guy who still had a contract bringing trees down out of the mountains, you know. And I'd go up with him and I'd fall the timber. He'd skid it and we'd load it and bring it down. It was a contract thing. There was a big recession in 1970. Eventually our baby was born in Bozeman, Montana. And uh, I spent a year in Bozeman, or around there, working construction. Uh, the timing was wrong for going into the school. I couldn't. I would have done that for money too, had I had the timing been right. With something about credits. I mean, uh, um, quarters and semesters. Yeah. And. Uh, I had the last construction job in the entire state of Montana, and it went out of business. I mean, it, when that job ended, it was over. There was a prison guard job in Montana, and there was framing potato bins out of Ashton, Idaho, for two thirty an hour. And a car, I bought my first car, which it finally broke down, but then I got a second one. But anyway, I went back in the Army. I saw a recruiter. I realized I could get, I could get 500 bucks a month plus bennies for my family if I went back in the army again. I figured I knew enough about it to not have to go back to Vietnam. I wasn't quite sure still. I mean, well, yeah, I was. It, nothing turned out to be the way I thought, I thought it was going to be. I was very disappointed in the representative government that we have. The fact that our system allowed so many of its cream of my generation to be absolutely wasted for a fallacy you know a fleeting fallacy even which kept changing depending upon who wanted to twist it a certain way Nixon was president then and uh, I remember feeling almost like a mercenary to go back in the army for a job but I had a baby and a wife and a sense of responsibility and also I missed the structure. I missed my own sense of responsibility. I missed having the ability to be in charge of 
people and places and things to do something that mattered. And so I went back to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, joined the, um, <clears throat> um, we had a second baby, a little boy. Um, my wife is still anti-military hippie, hated every bit of it, couldn't stand the macho scene when we'd have our, you know, when we'd do our, what guys do when they're soldiers and jump on airplanes, you know. You go play soldier and you do stuff that is, um, you know, riled her. But it paid our bills and if she didn't have to do it, I did it. And I felt okay about it. And I got into diving. And I became a military diver. I went through the Special Forces diving training done in Key West, Florida. Then I went through the Navy's second class divers training with a specialty on um, diving medicine, hyperbaric chamber operations, highly technical things. Um, then I got uh, assigned to the um, first Special Forces group in Okinawa. And they had a, and they were still doing Vietnam at the time. I, I knew. Once I got to Okinawa, that probably they would send us. We weren't supposed to have troops on the ground in Vietnam, but they got over that by calling it temporary duty, TDY. You'd be stationed in Okinawa, but they'd send teams over to Vietnam for just a week or two. You know, so they weren't really there in Vietnam. It was just another way of manipulating the information. But it was still Vietnam, and it was still a waste. People were still dying. So I put all of my energy into trying to get on a scuba detachment, which I did. So I became an instructor on a scuba detachment in Okinawa. And we trained underwater demolitions and, you know, underwater operations basically to Korean allies and, and the Philippines. We had underwater demo school in the Philippines. So I'm going back and forth uh, teaching classes as part of a team that was teaching, instructing in Okinawa, Philippines, and. Uh, in Korea. Saw some of the greatest diving in the whole world. Um, avoided going back to Vietnam. Got out of the Army the second time in December of 1973. And uh, my wife left me the next day. She left me the next day. I took both the kids and was gone. That was it. And uh, she was done with me and it and everything. So. Uh, so I'm in the West Coast and uh, I was trying to find a place to live and uh, where to be and I just went up from Canada to Mexico along the coast and uh, ended up in Santa Cruz. One thing leads to another yeah. and um, I've lived here since 1975. Um, I got married. At, Again, well, I got divorced from the first wife. Both of my kids, though, I got custody of them. I brought them to Santa Cruz. They graduated from Santa Cruz High School. I'm the dad of two kids, stepkids, who graduated from Santa Cruz High School. Um, altogether, I have five kids now, considering three stepkids plus two. Uh, my daughter, Jenin, just had a little baby girl, you know, and uh, she's 45. And she just had a baby girl. But anyway, hey, it, life happens, you know, and it's a good thing when it does. And um, I've, I've been married to Michelle for 30-something years now. And um, I became, well, I challenged the state board, got a nurse's license eventually, worked as a nurse uh, at all the hospitals and for the uh, different boards around here. Went to Cabrillo College, you know, studied drama, studied health science, went to UCSC, studied drama, changed my major to psychology when I started, uh, I found out about post-traumatic stress disorder. I found out about that in 1979 when I had my own issue. I, you know, I don't mind telling you. Um, uh, I was working as a nurse at community hospital and an old guy died and I cleaned him up and was waiting for the morgue van to come and I just started flashing on dead marines. I said, okay, that's enough of this. I'm done. No more medicine for me. And I found out that there was such a thing as PTSD and I just, because I had a license with the state, I was able to hook up with a local psychiatrist and start counseling Vietnam veterans for trauma. So much easier. I could still be a medic. There's no blood, there's no guts, I don't change any bandages, you know, I don't have to do CPR, you know, I, let me, you know, this is cool, I can do this. So I did that for quite a few years under contract to the VA. And uh, 
That's pretty much my tail. I'm sticking to it. Yeah. I can show you some of these photos if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. If you care. Writing after a while. Is this time to take? Is this time, to take, what, what is this time to take a break or? Oh yeah. Ask me a question. <laughs> no, it's just Please, about I've been talking the whole time. Hospital so. haunt with the years were you there? Because I worked. The there. last year was seventy nine. Okay, mm -hmm. just before my time. Yeah. You, st you also didn't you start a, a, a Vietnam vets group in Santa Cruz? Yes, I did. I started. I was studying drama and I was doing the screaming memes and working out with. There was a um, a feminist uh, drama instructor uh, who I was working with, and all of the issues she had had to do with her politics and feminism and stuff. And I just felt like there was nobody was doing what I really wanted to do. So. I just put out the word to try to get a couple of veterans together to do some drama. Well, <clears throat> let me back up. Part of my continuing education as a nurse had been, I had studied with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who's doing death and dying, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And what she had been doing was psychodrama with her AIDS patient mostly, but they were other terminally ill people. And so I did some continuing education workshops with her up in uh, up in the San Juan Islands, and there was another place too that I did. A, I did another one down at Escondido, I think, and down by San Diego. So I just decided to integrate that into my own thing. So I put out flyers trying to get veterans together to talk about their issues, and I wanted to do the theater a, a play. So we actually did eventually get two plays going. One of them called Falling Back Regroup, which is basically psychodramas from our particular stories all melded into one. And it was very healing and soothing. And I thought, well, this might be a really nice thing to do for post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. for people suffering from PTSD. So I <clears throat> had a job at the time also working as an outreach technician for Menlo Park had a PTSD treatment program, the VA. So I was an outreach tech to them and I had associations with them and I started to integrate that with them but the VA system is too rigid for that so I couldn't really do what I had wanted to do. But I did start counseling with a psychiatrist using my psych tech license basically and nurses license and experience as a medic to you know, talk to people, listen to them, help them deal with their issues. You can see I've got a few myself, you know. <laughs> so, but but that's what I had been doing all along anyway. I mean, the whole time I'm in the military, all of these guys are war veterans, including the old World War II hangman, you know, the tanker that had been a hangman. Mm -hmm. He had those same issues. I mean, I'm a trainee, but you know, he, I, you know, I talked, I listened, I paid attention. I came back and that's all you have to do is just listen and be there most of the time and not be freaked out by whatever you hear. Mm -hmm. So um, I enjoyed uh, developing the veterans group here at the time. Um, we utilized the vessel for a lot of things. Um, eventually I got a contract with the VA. Uh, uh, the doctor and the veteran service officer and other people with the county vet services helped me put together nonprofits and we created a nonprofit had a contract with the VA and for quite a few years nine years actually I think I was one of the primary post-traumatic stress counselors for Santa Cruz and Benito and parts of Monterey County until eventually I couldn't take it anymore I had to stop and they brought in a vet center as soon as I quit on 30th of June, 1992, <laughs> the end of the fiscal year, the vet center came and showed up. They outstationed from San Jose and they outstationed from somewhere else. Now they actually have a vet center over on 41st Avenue in, uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Capitola. And uh, good, I worked day. myself out of a job. <laughs> worked somebody else into a good one, actually, one thing or another. So that's been kind of nice. That's good. I, uh, I'm now pleasantly retired from a, from, uh, just, I'm married to a wonderful woman who also is pleasantly retired. She worked for the county. Um, 
We have a little acre out in Coralitas, you know. Have dogs and grandchildren and cat and live the good life, you know. Grow roses, you know. Very nice. Very Taste very red very wine nice. sometimes. Yeah, oh, very nice. Uh, so it was, it was the veterans community is is a very stimulating thing to me. I'm still maintaining my friendships with some of my close veteran friends from the war. Some of them have died already, and I was there when they died. In fact, this one, Dale Lee, I was with him when he died in Utah. This is us at Da Nang, uh, three SF medics right here. Lee, myself, and Silver. These two guys, I didn't really know them that well, but I know this guy, he died um, when that plane crashed with all the civilians, 150 civilians on it when Camp Duck was being overrun on the 10th or the 12th of May of 1968. Uh, but Dale Lee, I was with him when he passed away. I've been with several others too when they passed away. In fact, a lot of my volunteer work has been with hospice here. And they always assign me to veterans. Anyway. Photos. Yeah, this is a, a mountain yard man from the Brew tribe at a refugee camp in Camelot Village right during the middle of the war. He was one of the refugees. And he's trying to scratch out a living. You can see he's got his hoe. Refugees leave with what's on their back or what they can carry. He carried his hoe. And, um, is it, shall I just go through it mm -hmm. like this? Sure. Please this please. is a couple of friends of mine at FOB3 at Mylock getting ready to go to work on a mission. This one is, uh, they're loading up, up to go out on a body recovery uh, mission with a hatchet force. And uh, this is a picture of me at Quezon during the siege, uh, like right towards the end of the siege, um, where we hadn't been able to get out and go around and check the area out. I just came back in from that. I found a flower. The whole place had been blown up, so it was kind of unusual to have a flower. And I always wanted to be a hippie, so I called myself a flower child with medicine stick. And. Uh, that. This is a picture of a crater and a church and an orchard just as we we're leaving Quezon Combat Base at the end of the siege when we victoriously uh, left uh, it to the enemy. And that was an old Frenchman, the Polaine Plantation. There's actually bodies in that big hole in front of it. I took this picture from the back of a truck when we were leaving. This is a picture of two of the mountain yard women that I took care of when I was doing a med cap at the refugee camp near Camlo in 1968. It might have been in May or June of 68, actually. This is a picture of one of my SF medic friends, uh, Mike Lacey who now lives in Anchorage, Alaska, um, taking care of an elderly woman. Well, she's not even elderly. She's only 33 years old. But we could determine she was 33. But she had everything wrong with you that you can have wrong with you and still be living. And we had just washed her off with the betadine solution over here by the slit trench we had made. We're still in a tent. And uh, we're taking her back to put her on a stretcher and start an IV. And I recall that she had had several uh, diseases, uh, rickettsial diseases, uh, several types of dysentery, malaria, you know. We fixed her, uh, she became better. She got better, she gained weight, and uh, she was happy. Okay. Went back to smoking strong tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> and these are two mountain yard women, brew mountain yard women that I recall taking care of, and I think Yep, one of them smoking a pipe, homemade pipe out of aluminum they had rolled up from probably some crashed airplane. They picked up some aluminum and did that. And this is another picture of the Mountain Yard women. They were just doing their laundry at the ditch on the side of the road at the refugee camp. 
These are people whose family I took care of, whose language I learned a little bit of, whom I loved. I loved them. And uh, this is another picture of leaving Case on Combat Base from the back of that same truck. We're leaving at the end of the siege when it's all over. Just going through what had been a really voluptuous, lush orchard. I heard at one time. I never really saw the orchard part. This is a woman whose tooth, infected tooth, had gotten much, much worse. Wait a minute. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, we took care of her, though. You can see the necrotic tissue around the area. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. SF makes fixed that. When nobody else wanted to deal with it, or they sent them to us. And we just do what we can, and usually people got better. Here's a couple of little mountain yard kids. I just loved them, you know, and it just, this picture shows it all. They're just happy-go-lucky children in the middle of war. This is another little girl who had malaria big time. Her dad was a mercenary who worked for us. He brought her in one day, put her on her best thing you could put on her, which was a USAID donated sweater. But she's still wearing a necklace with the family jewels on it, basically French coins that they had. And here's another picture of her. She was so afraid of, of me because, well, I'm a foreigner, you know, different than her daddy. But you can see the loving touch. Here is a picture of, oh man, Garland, Moore, Donahue, and me at Quezon in front of the combat base. There's another lieutenant in the background. I can't remember his name right now. But uh, those people, I'm still in touch with them occasionally. Here's the picture of Vietnamese kids at the Mylock Marketplace looking at dead NVA soldiers. I'll put them together. I took one picture and swiveled around and took the other picture next to it. These kids are looking at the same scene. And uh, let me see. This is a picture of a dead US soldier whom I had actually put the skull up on the stick like that so that I could take a picture for dental identification, possibly. I was going to put it back down with the rest of the body, but you can see I put my rifle next to it for just for um, perspective. Mm -hmm. But we came under artillery fire by the Marines at Quezon Combat Base. They were shooting at us with 155 millimeters, heavy duty howitzers, and we had to run for our lives and made it out of there. Here's another picture of a dead American. Um, both of these dead Americans have recently, the remains were recently, well, five years or so ago, they were recovered. They had belonged, they had been Air Force, members of an Air Force. They had been on a C-130 that was shot down. Mm -hmm. I think, I'm not absolutely positive, but I think that's true. And um, this particular picture, I have sent copies of this to the lab, to um, the, the MIA joint recovery team. I sent them the six digit coordinates. I tried to get them to send me back to Vietnam. I could show them right where it was. But they were eventually recovered uh, when the Vietnamese were bulldozing a road along an old trail near Quezon. So this is a picture of myself and Donahue um, after a long night. We're carrying the weapons of enemy soldiers that we killed. That was the 19th of August, 1968, actually. we just come in off of that night ambush. I would put down my own gear, and uh, we posed for a picture with one of our buddies uh, with my camera, carrying the weapons that we picked up off the dead guys. This is a picture of myself and Schaff and Cherokon at Quezon during the siege. And the two Vietnamese guys in front of us are actually mountain yards. They're brew mountain yards. They were orphans. We raised them. We adopted them. We 
loved them. We were their parents. Actually, I went back to Vietnam four times since the war. I've taken groups back to vi revisit the sites that we served. And I found one of these guys, Cock, this one right here. I found him. Yep, I found Cock. I found him in 97. He had died by 99 of tuberculosis, I think. But it was kind of really cool finding him and tracking him down and giving him everything I could, you know. That was fun. And this is Cock and my and me outside of the medical tent at Mylock, FOB3 Mylock, um, in the middle of that action. I think that was close to my 22nd birthday, but I'm not sure. I'm so glad you brought, you bought that camera. Yeah, that camera. yeah. it, it got stolen the day I left the Vietnam too. <laughs> wow. I've, got a, I've got all the negatives and everything from it. I haven't, some of them I haven't even developed. Yeah. I think you, you answered every question on here except for, did you have any sort of R&R? Yes, I did have R&R. I took uh, R&R um, to Hong Kong in, um, I don't remember when, it must have been after we got to Mylock, so that was probably July okay. of 1968. I had five days in Hong Kong and I just wandered around and drank and had a girlfriend and bought um, sound equipment and a Kai. Yeah, I found a lot of sound equipment and uh, shipped it home. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, just <laughs> actually, I smuggled a Walter PP into Hong Kong on my body. I couldn't go anywhere without a weapon, uh -huh. and I was not supposed to do that. But it just, I had it had it taped and wrapped really tightly up inside my crotch, my groin, mm -hmm. up against my left leg, I think it was, and. I emptied my pockets, I had the bullets in my pockets with the change, and they inspect you when you go through, and you and I lied and said, no, I don't have anything, I, all the, the, the free drops, you know, I, I didn't do it, and the guy felt me up all the way up to my crotch uh, on the right side, but he didn't touch the left side where the gun was, but they saw the bullet one of the bullets. And they were like, it alerted them to me. And I, I said, ah, I forgot to take it out. You know, I just threw it away. So I was like paranoid the whole time I was in Hong Kong. <laughs> they actually came knocking on my hotel door looking for a weapon. So I smuggled it in and I smuggled it back out. And that was it. And I, I had uh, intended to, um, I don't know what I intended. I just needed to have a weapon to sleep. Mm -hmm. I couldn't sleep without a weapon, and uh, that continued like that for most of my life, actually. I mean, I'm not like that anymore, but um, for many, many years afterwards, I needed a weapon mm -hmm. handy, somewhere close within reach, just in case. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, did your experience in the Army change the way you feel about war or military? It did. <laughs> it did, truly did. It changed everything about um, my impression of the way the world works and politics and war in particular. I think it's the most horrid, horrible thing that human beings are capable of doing. I think that uh, our tendency to do warfare is going to end us as a species. Right now we're pretty dominant on the planet because we're so good at war. But within the context of this society of the United States, as I understand it in the way that the structure said it, we're still trying to work it out, but I really think that it's extremely important that the citizens become thoroughly involved in every aspect of any war that our country uh, engages itself in for whatever reason. And that we all have a vested interest in that. I mean, just because we decide not to go to war doesn't mean that somebody else is not going to decide to go to war with us. So the nature of humans and the history, all history, 
from the cuneiform imprints and wet clay has been the story of warfare of one kind or another or somebody bragging about their you know what they did how many people they took or you know um, so I think this is sort of a unique system that we have right now I like to think so and I hope that the representative form of government and um, and the um, and an informed electorate you know, I hope people can continue to inform themselves and take it with the most dire of seriousness because the consequences are horrible. I mean, yeah, I think it's impacted my impression of, of uh, the military. I think the military experience prepared me for a lot of things besides just going to warfare. You know, the medical training that I got was great. It was wonderful. I used it on the outside here a lot. Um, I'm so glad I became a, especially a special forces medic. Not to be redundant on the special part, but, you know, it was like being a primary care physician and a nurse practitioner and a lab tech. And, I mean, you know, you can take care of people. That was very helpful. I personally because of the the conflict of the Vietnam War, it sort of broke our whole society down and my impression is that it did. I just had one little piece of it, you know, but I observed it in a lot of different ways. I still think that there should be mandatory service, that everyone should serve in some form, if not in the military, some sort of public service. You know, kind of based sort of on the Israeli model. You can keep a standing army. You can keep them and nobody will, I mean, you look at Switzerland. <laughs> They've got a standing army. Everybody's got guns. Nobody's going to invade Switzerland. They know what to do about it. You know, they can protect themselves and defend themselves. What's going on now in the United States, I don't, I, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I, I think we should go, you know, we should continue to modify and perfect our system. But, but, you know, one vote, I never miss voting. I mean, I have missed two or three times in my life, but, you know, I, circumstances. Um, I care about the country. I care about my society. Um, I'm sad about the loss of Vietnam, the loss of the lives in Vietnam, the loss of the ideals, the loss of the structures, the way our government is set up to do things so that checks and balances can work. But it, I like to think that we're learning from it. I have. Of course, people who were born since then, everybody gets to learn it over again, whatever it is they're going to do. Um, but um, it's just extremely serious business, and uh, it should not be taken lightly or engaged in. Mm -hmm. and I, that's why I think our society should be fully vested in any war that the United States is engaged in. And uh, so that's how I feel about it. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Was there anything else that we haven't discussed that you want to add before we sign off? <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's so very detailed. It was yeah. wonderful. Well, thank you. The um, only thing I can really think of off the bat is of interest is that when I was working with Vietnam veterans as a counselor that um, I met some of the finest people some of them were heavy-duty combat veterans that had done the dirty you know they had done the dirty killing and being killed but they're so wonderful they really put their heart and soul and best energies into the well-being of our social unit, our society, us. Even if we spat on them and kicked them, and it didn't matter. You know, that's small stuff compared to what really matters. You know, so I really got to know a lot of those guys in a nice way. I also was privileged to take, be able to take four teams, four groups of people back to Vietnam to do a real hearts and minds um, visit where we met up with former enemy soldiers, we built clinics, we provided medicines, we um, 
built wells, bought cows, you know, on our own, small groups each time. It would only be a group of four or five. We would get tens of thousands of dollars and ship loads of supplies donated and hand them over to hospitals and, and you know, give them to, the, to good people in the places that the war kept getting in the way of us uh, accomplishing that during the war. Mm -hmm. So that was really nice. That's the only thing I can think of. Life is good. You know? good. Well, thank Keep you. on living it. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, Robert. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm quite long-winded.